Dividend investors, bonjour, Mikey Hu here, founder of Dividend Stocks Rocks and passionate investor. Uh, for this video, I decided to answer nine questions that I keep getting all the time. So it's pretty much um, a video about answers that I'm using for my strategies. We're gonna talk about um, Canadian versus US investment. We're gonna talk about ETF, about gold, um, about my returns, and um, let's get started with the first question. So Mike, for Canadian, is it worth it to invest in US stocks? First, you have to consider the currency fluctuation and then you have to consider withholding taxes in some account. Um, so am I not just better to just invest in Canadian stocks and forget about the rest? Uh, very interesting question. The thing is, if you don't invest in the US market, you are going to miss on most of companies that are exposed to international markets. You're going to miss on companies like Microsoft, like Lockheed Martin, Procter & Gamble, Colgate Palmolives. Um, those companies don't exist in Canada. We don't have those incredibly diversified selling their products or their services across the world. Um, we have a very small tech in the, uh, tech sector in Canada. Um, we're mostly focused on finance and resources. Um, outside of that, consumer cyclicals, consumer um, defensive. Also, it's a little bit low on this part in terms of options. So for those reasons, I would definitely invest in U.S. stocks. Uh, personally, I try to keep my uh, portfolio between 50 to 50, 50, so 50% 50 around Canadian and then 50 in U.S. Um, the thing is, uh, the U.S. market is more profitable in general. So over time, I'm pretty much 40% uh, Canadian and 60% U.S. stocks. Uh, now, another question that comes in often is what am I doing uh, if I invested um, all my money in my RSPs and now I'm left with my TFSA or non-registered um, account where there's, there is a withholding taxes of 15% on the dividend paid. So if you're making profit, you don't have to pay um, taxes on a TFSA. However, if you're receiving dividend, then you have to pay a 15% withholding tax that is actually being taken away uh, by your broker right away. So you don't even see it. Uh, my suggestion here is to keep your uh, low yield I growth potential stocks such as Microsoft, Apple, Visa, BlackRock, uh, Starbucks. So everything that is paying like between like probably under 1.5% yield, you can have them in your TFSA or your non-registered account because the withholding tax will not have a big impact. Now, second question, why don't you invest in ETF? Um, I don't for a few reasons. Um, a lot of investors love ETF investing because it's passive, because they have instant diversification right away. The fees are low, it's easy to trade. You don't have to have any headaches into the valuation process or an, uh, having a complete investing strategy. You just buy the ETF, you follow the market and you're all good. Um, I don't like it even though it works and that's perfectly fine if it works for you as well because I acknowledge that ETF investing is great. However, I prefer to pick my own stock. One of the first reason is whenever I look at ETF um, for something that is comparable to my strategy, right now my uh, returns are better. So it's already a good reason to invest in what you know and how you can control it. And the second thing is most of the time when I look at ETF, um, there is one thing that I start looking at first is to look at their top holdings. So top 10, top 25, just to have an idea of um, where they put their money. So if after reading the description about the investing philosophy or what they're tracking. Now you look at their top holdings to make sure that it fits with, within your investing strategy. And most of the time, obviously I focus on ETF and on dividend investing. Most of the time uh, when I look at an ETF top holdings, I will identify two, three uh, big component that I would not invest in if I had to uh, select my own portfolio. So for that reason, I'm not comfortable buying ETF, leaving all those choices to others than myself. And the second one is um, my performance are better. Uh, speaking of which, a lot of people are asking me about my investment returns. Um, I'm recording a full podcast on that. It will be right there in the, low, in the link below. Um, honestly, the investment return doesn't really matter that much as compared to do you reach your investing goals. Uh, some people will be super happy to average four or 5% a year as long as their portfolio is stable, they're not 
facing too much fluctuation. When the market crashes, they're well protected and they sleep well at night with that. And this is perfect. The best investment strategy is the one that helps you sleep at night. Um, in my regards, uh, we do have DSR portfolio models. You can look at them um, on the website. You just click on portfolio on the menu. You'll get the returns. They are updated daily. You'll see that we perform very well. And I also publish my own portfolio report uh, performance monthly. Uh, it's not all my investments, obviously. The reason why I'm not publishing all my investment return is mostly because I prefer to look at my pension plan portfolio because I cannot add any money to it. So therefore, I cannot hide bad performance because I just added another $50,000 into this account. It is locked in. Um, the only thing I can do is to cash dividend, is to receive dividend and then buy new stocks with it, but I cannot add capital. So it's a great real life case study. Uh, you can go at the dividendguyblog.com and look at my monthly update on it. You'll see all my positions. You'll see how much I'm making. You'll see how much I, I generate in dividend. Everything is laid out over there. Next question. What do you think of gold to protect your portfolio? Um, you know what? Gold is a bet on fear. That's what it is. So when the market crashes, gold price goes up. It's only natural. However, if I look at this pencil and I put it on my desk and it's in gold, pure gold, and I wait 25 years, it's still going to be the same pencil. So is it really worth it? I'm not too sure. Uh, it's not making any sense for me uh, just because it's not a producing asset. I'm a big defender of the offense is the best defense. In terms of gold, it doesn't generate anything, so I don't see the added value to my portfolio. And if you look back over the past 30 years, uh, unfortunately, gold is not generating much returns for investors. So in terms of crashes, you're super happy to have it, but over time, there's not much growth and then the hype fades. Uh, we have another great example of 2020. So in 2020, the gold price skyrocketed. Everybody were saying, we're going to see gold price $3,000 per ounce by the end of this year, never happened. And now we're hovering under $2,000, like around 1,600, 1,700, 1,800. Uh, not that exciting. And those people that bought it at $2,000 an ounce, uh, they are going to likely have to wait until the next uh, panic attack um, the market, and then they may make a few bucks. If not, not gonna, not much gonna happen over it. So I rather invest in dividend growers, which will prove that has proven that they can go through recession to market crisis and still increase their dividend. This is how I protect my portfolio. Uh, next question, how many stocks should an investor have in their portfolio? That is a very personal question. It really depends on the type of investors you are. Uh, what I prefer to say here is any numbers between 20 to 40 should be enough for you to have a well diversified portfolio and should be enough for you to capture all the best of breeds for each sector. So build a portfolio that you like within the sectors that you love um, that will fit your investing strategy. Um, over 40, you're getting closer to an ETF. So I'm not too sure if you're adding value to it. It's like adding a fourth or a fifth bank in your portfolio, not getting much added value on it. If you're under 20 uh, stocks, um, if you're beginning in, if you're a beginner investor, that's fine because you're building it. After 10, you can get some kind of good diversification, but yet you should reach out to at least 20 to make sure that you have the sectors and also the subsectors that you're looking for. The one last thing that is super important about how many stocks you should have in your portfolio is actually how many stocks are you able to follow quarterly. Um, you know that already at DSR Pro, we follow about 1,000 dividend paying stocks quarterly. So we look at their earnings, uh, we issue a report, a, qu a quick summary, and we send them to our DSR Pro members. So they don't have to do that hard job. So they don't have to look at investors presentation or, or the press release and look at the numbers. We do that for them. We highlight what's important in that report and then 
they can look at uh, one or two companies in their portfolio to make sure that um, everything is running smoothly or maybe they should sell, maybe they should buy more. So at least they have been highlighted in the first place. If you're doing that on your own and you have 55 stocks in your portfolio, that's a lot of work every quarter. It's pretty much a full-time job, right? Uh, we have a, a complete team doing that. We have like five people looking at all the earnings um, at DSR. So it's going to give you an idea of like how much time you need to spend on 55 or 100 stocks in your portfolio. This is why, again, if you're over uh, around 30, you'll, chances are that you're going to be on top on each news. You're not going to miss anything and uh, you will not get caught by bad news or bad event going down further the road. Uh, next question is, do you use covered calls to boost your income? Um, I don't. Uh, one of the main reasons is because I focus a lot of my time running my business and not so much on my portfolio. So I like to have it on autopilot for most of it. Uh, it is an interesting strategy. I am looking into it and possibly building a full course on covered call uh, strategy. That could be quite interesting for a lot of retirees or income seeking investors because you're holding your stocks, you're getting the dividend and then you write covered calls on it. Hopefully you keep the stocks and then you just uh, get some premium out of it as a new source of income. That could be interesting. If you're looking at covered call ETF, they're not that exciting to be honest. Uh, whenever you look at the underlying asset and you compare on the market, if the market is good, is going well, it, like let's take uh, ZWB, uh, BMO, uh, bank covered call ETF. If you look at all banks versus ZWB, you're going to realize that buying banks will make you a lot more money in terms of total return than having the covered call. So it's not a bad strategy. It does what it's supposed to do. So it offers you a higher yield, but you're leaving a lot of money on the table because you can make a lot more money with capital appreciation on those companies instead of writing down um, and instead of having more dividend from the covered call. So for the ETF, I'd say it's a no. Um, to write down a covered call on your portfolio could be interesting. Then again, requires a little more time and more expertise. Um, now, what about drips? What about dripping? Do you drip or not? Um, I don't. Um, dripping is a perfect way to put your portfolio on autopilot. So whenever you receive dividend, uh, the dividend is getting used to buy shares of that stock right away. So if I have a lot of shares of Telus, for example, and I receive some good money out of it in terms of dividend, the money does not sit in my account and sleep there generating nothing. It buys automatically more shares of TELUS. Uh, that makes sense because I already like TELUS. I did my analysis and I love it. So I want more share of it. So that makes sense. The reason why I don't drip is simply because I prefer to rebalance my portfolio using dividends. Uh, so whenever I want to make a trade, I want to sell a stock and then buy a new position. I will also add my dividend payments out of it to make a better purchase, a larger purchase. Obviously, I need to be a little bit more active because if I just wait on that cash on my account for like a year or two, then I have a few thousand dollars that are sleeping there and not generating any money. So depending on the type of investors you want, you are, um, if you want to be a little bit more active and use those dividend payments to rebalance your portfolio the way you want, um, then don't drip. If you're happy with the portfolio you have right now and you just want to keep it growing on autopilot, dripping is a perfect strategy. Uh, now, two more questions. How often do you trade? Again, similar to how many stocks you have in your portfolio, that is a very personal question. Uh, it depends on investors and the type of investors you are. Personally, I rarely trade more than three times a year now. I used to trade every week when I was young. Uh, when I started investing in 2003, I was like uh, a vivid trader. So I was buying and selling all the time. And now that I've moved all my portfolio towards dividend growth stocks, the magic of dividend growth investing is all about compounding interest. So you just let your winners run. They increase their dividend year after year. You use that increased payment to buy more shares and then you run with it. Uh, so that means I don't do many uh, trades. Sometimes I may 
do like one or two in a year, sometimes up to four, but on average, it's never higher than four per year. Uh, similar approach is being used for our DSR portfolio where we're going to look at our portfolio quarterly, make sure that everything fits within our investment thesis, and then we're gonna perform some small adjustment, but not that much. Again, the key here is to stay invested in the long run with your winners. This is how you're gonna build a very strong portfolio. Uh, the next one and the last one that is very interesting, should I wait for the next market crash to invest? Um, at the time of recording, we are end of August. Uh, obviously, the market is just going crazy again. Um, very high valued by many. Uh, if you look at the P ratio and pretty much all valuation methodologies will show you that we are really at the peak in terms of valuation for the market for both US and Canadian. So it's very hard to find um, good buys, but they exist. And I think that waiting is a losing game. If you wait, you may wait three months, you may wait three years, you may wait five years, or it can happen tomorrow. But the thing is, when the market's gonna drop by 10%, you're gonna tell yourself, oh, I'm gonna wait because now the drop is starting and I'm going to wait because it's 10% is not enough. And then it goes to 20 and then you're just thinking, oh, maybe I should get in, but what if it drops by another 20%? We saw that in the past too, right? So you're getting into that dynamic of maybe it's the right time, maybe it's not. Maybe it's gonna drop more, maybe it's not. And then if it goes back up a little bit, then you're maybe thinking, oh, it may be over, or maybe it's a dead cat bounce, and then it's gonna go over a little bit, and then it drops right away again. Um, so all of those questions will create doubts. Doubts will put you to do more research, you're gonna to read more articles, and then you're going to get even more confused because you're going to analyze so many different type of opinion, one saying investment, right away. The other one will say, oh, wait in the, for the next three weeks because this and that is going to happen and then the market's going to crash again. And then you're going to end up with paralysis by analysis. You're not going to make any decision and you're not going to invest your money. And maybe that in two years from now, you're still going to be on the sideline. Um, think about that. If you're waiting right now to know if right now is the right moment to invest, I'm going to ask you why didn't you invest during March of 2020? And why didn't you invest during uh, November and December of 2018? Those were the two last bear markets. So a bear market is market crash by at least 20%. It happened twice already in the past three years. And if you haven't done anything on those two, well then you're probably very bad at determining the right timing to invest um, according to a crash. And don't worry, I'm as bad as you and I don't do it, so I stay invested all the time. Um, I know it's hard, I know it's not easy to start investing in this kind of uh, environment where everything, where everything looks overvalued. So I decided to create a new webinar um, helping you using stock valuation methods, knowing what to buy and knowing when to sell. Uh, so this, New webinar is on September 9th. If you watch this video after September 9th, don't worry, you can click on it and then you'll be able to register to watch the replay. Uh, it will be roughly an hour webinar, um, asking, uh, answering all your questions after that. So one hour for the presentation, one hour of Q and A. You can ask me pretty much anything, pretty much what I did today with this video, but your personal question, I can answer it as well. And we're gonna discuss uh, stock valuation tools, we're gonna to discuss what is the buy process right now in this crazy environment because there are ways to find very strong companies that will not let you down and you will not lose your shirt over them. And then we're gonna discuss um, what about selling? Like maybe there are a few things that you should sell right now and you can identify them without any doubts, move forward, invest with conviction and retire happy. Um, again, if you have liked this video, ask me other questions in the comment section, like that video, subscribe to my channel. Uh, I'm back with one video every week on Thursday. So let me know if you have any question about any topics or anything. I'll do my best to answer your question. And until the next video, stay invested.